an educational series on cyber security, compliance, and IT governance. Produced with the support of Freedom Technologies, Phoenix's leading managed service provider. Yeah, so the problem is, is that, uh, you know, going to the, they're overwhelmed, uh, you know, the attacker we know of has been in some of these organizations for months. Uh, let's just make, make numbers easy. Let's call it six months, you know, and again, they would have a resource problem. It's not like they did jump on 18,000 of those, uh, of the solar winds customers and do things to them immediately. But if I had scored this again, let's play, play bad guy here for a minute. If I had managed to get in, inject code in and all of a sudden I've got, you know, 18,000 people beaconing towards me that I can open the door and walk into their environment. I think at a minimum, what I would do is I would go in and I would inject into all those environments, um, you know, a long-term sleeping back door that would beacon out in let's say a year for anyone I wasn't immediately interested in, let it beacon out in a year and I'll come back to it. And then, you know, obviously, if they got that good of numbers coming back, they had to sift through them and decide who to go after. So how far did they get into some of these organizations that maybe not more than just a foothold, but a foothold large enough to where they could implant something and say, we'll come back another day. Um, not only would I implant, once I implanted, I would put it to sleep and I would tear out the stuff so that if it got found, because it has been found, the response would be, yeah, we were running the vulnerable version, but whew, we don't see any evidence of it. So you stop looking. Um, if I was one of those customers where I was running a vulnerable version and didn't see anything, I would be absolutely paranoid now. And the problem is, is you're going to start twitching at shadows. Now go back to the, how do you solve this problem? Um, you need resources. And what you need is you need people that are, and I'm going to use this word and some people get ruffled, I'm sure, but you need competent people to be able to look at the logs, look at system data, look at information and say, yes, we have an issue or no, we don't have an issue. And when it comes to the security professionals out there across the globe that do incident response, you're talking about a small number. Um, it's, it's not as big as everyone thinks. And when you talk about the ones that are competent to do the analysis that you're talking about, and in some cases, this isn't a deep analysis, it can be quick, but know that have the right skill sets to do an analysis, all of a sudden you start cutting that number down even more. So if I was a federal government, knowing that they had been hit so hard, um, I would expect them to be ever in every nook and cranny. And the fact of the matter is, and this will be another good point of discussion is the government, once you get a good level of um, training certification, you know, experience, most people leave the government realm because it can't pay the same as commercial. So the number of bodies that they have running around that are capable of doing some of the work that needs to be done are pretty minimal. And bringing people in at this point in time is also difficult because you've got, you know, 18,000 people potentially that are calling on the, uh, you know, everyone from uh, Mandiant to, uh, you know, CrowdStrike and everyone else who's got IR teams. So I think that there's a huge, huge problem with just resources, just flat out resources. Um, and again, you know, for those people that are still trying to build their organization or improve it, you know, looking for resources right now, especially high end ones, you're going to be pretty limited. So that's just my initial thread on that thought. Hey, Eric, uh, this is Gordon. Uh, Basically, worst case, what you're talking about, especially for the organizations that are, believe that they have a real problem, number one. Number two, are resource limited. You're talking about a burn down uh, scenario. It's easier to uh, off to the side, rebuild, transition in a very clean way your data and verified validated applications and then uh, pull the plug on the potentially uh, compromised and do a Sony where you uh, 
back up the dump trucks. Yes. Yes. Um, one of the areas that I've always been very, very interested in um, from a malware analysis and uh, so from a, um, an attack scenario and from a responder scenario, one of the areas I've always been interested in is embedding yourself in firmware. Um, and this is not new. It's been done for years. Uh, DEF CON presentations on this go back into, you know, DEF CON 3, 4, talking about it um, with real practical demonstrations of how to do it and things doing it back that far as well. Um, I, I mean, you know, if I'm an attacker and you are a high value target, okay, you're a defense agency or something like that, and I need to maintain persistence. I'm probably going to drop something in there. I'm going to do an implant and I want to do an implant in firmware. And when I implant in firmware, uh, I'm going to do something ridiculous. I'm going to install myself in the flashable firmware of your DVD drive or your Blu-ray drive. Okay. How many people have ever even upgraded the firmware on a Blu-ray or a DVD drive? They're flashable. I can tell you mine is. Okay. They're flashable, but most people, the only thing they ever do is the system BIOS. Um, so how are you ever going to find me? You know, so if, if these attackers, and I don't know that they are, to be perfectly honest, but if these attackers are using those types of, you know, methods to implant and embed themselves, um, yes, you have your worst case scenario is you build it new. Um, God help you. You have to figure out what kind of filter you're going to run data through to make sure that it doesn't bring something over into the other side. And people initially, you know, always go, well, that's easy, it's data. Really? I can embed things in Word documents. I can embed things in Excel documents. I can embed things in images. I can embed things in PowerPoint, okay? It's a lot harder than you think to make sure data coming across is sterile. Um, so it's, it's an incredible lift and shift. And that's why a lot of people, are very hesitant to go down that road, but I think that in many cases that's what needs to be done. Again, risk-based decision. You know, if you are controlling national defense for a country, you got to take this real serious. So again, this is where this is where management, those CISOs, those C-level people, get to earn their pay. So Eric, let me drop another idea in here to give you just a slight nudge over from your main concept of jumping into firmware. And let me paint for you the picture of, instead of going for firmware, go for the graphics processing card. You've got nope. CPUs, you've got memory. Yep. You have nobody anywhere with antiviral anything ever thinking to look at that subsystem. Yep watching for any kind of malicious activity or just strange behavior. Yep, absolutely. And, and it gets even worse because, you know, if you look at the, the, the flash in a uh, video card or even a system, you know, your BIOS isn't that big. It really isn't, okay? But because the cost of chipsets have come down and things like that, do they buy, you know, a four meg chipset for your system BIOS? No, it was cheaper for them to buy a 16 meg one. So they put in 16 megs, okay? Same can happen, by the way, on a video card. So they buy what's effectively, you know, cost effective for them and handles the job and it may have extra space. And if it's got extra space in it, that makes it even better for me. Um, the only reason I didn't use my scenario, my worst case scenario of video cards, which by the way, I agree with 110% is because in some environments, they do upgrade video uh, firmware more often and you have the potential, okay? And I say potential because it, remember it all depends on how you're, this code has been written, what it looks for, to overwrite it and destroy it. Um, again, depending on how the code is and where it's sitting in the stack, if it's low enough, it can say, ah, you're gonna overwrite me. Let me load all my self in memory, let you go ahead and write that new firmware onto the video, and then I'll rehook it and put myself back. Again, lots of different scenarios here. This is where we can play the hypothetical game all day long about how, what they could have done. But the danger is, is that it's not all hypothetical, okay? Injecting code into firmware is real. It's been done. 
Um, you know, and there's lots, all you have to do is go out and Google a little bit and you'll find all kinds of stuff on it. So that, that's going to make it very difficult in the first place. Um, and what, kind of what we talked about earlier about supply chain attacks, uh, chain attacks also comes into play here because, you know, this code was signed. So obviously they didn't, you know, what they did is they injected their code into the process so that it would, you know, continue flowing through. They didn't take over the update process like you saw with um, some of the stuff going back to semantic. I don't know how many people remember the, the, some of the semantic updater attacks um, many, many, many years ago. But so they injected it into the into the environment, which means in solar winds, they had to be in there long enough to understand how the software was being compiled, what the flow was, and they found a very nice place to inject their code. Um, in addition, um, you know, there was crypto and stenography that was used in this. So that makes it even harder to find. Um, this was done with a very clear intent. I should also note that this was not the only supply chain attack that's occurred recently. Um, a lot of attention wasn't drawn to it, but there was one that impacted over in Israel, UAE, and a couple of other places. Uh, and I think there was recently one also over in Southeast Asia. I can't remember all the details on it. So the trend is here. And like I said, my fear is this is going to become like ransomware. We're going to now see this as the in thing. Also, uh, given that this is a supply chain problem and it's DevOps, you get into access control and specifically code management. I mean, Microsoft is a large organization, probably is fairly well isolated a along task lines, i.e. Office 365 is hopefully not going to have access to the OSs, to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, across the products. But when you get into solar winds, uh, you have to start asking the smaller companies when they, uh, do they really provide access control between developers and testers and the rest of the company management, uh, 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 customer engineers, etc. And then it goes back into who actually has control of the code management and, and what, who is access, uh, who has up provided updates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That brings into a large scale, a large uh, amount of questions in terms of just overall system integrity. And this, uh, I mean, if you go back to NIST 800, you have 20 families, only four of which are technical. Everything else is management process, uh, supply chain management, uh, software development, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you're this is an attack across the full attack surface of the whole spear, just not a plane of uh, in terms of development or or anything else. This is this is everywhere. Right, right. I mean, and again, you know, the bad guys have to play by no rules. So where are they going to attack and what they're going to do? They're pretty pretty well open which makes it even harder to answer questions that you get from your management about, well, how can this impact us? What's our chances? What's our risk? And again, until you know more about the attack itself, which quite honestly, let's be honest, we may not get a whole lot more from anyone who's been compromised like this, because again, the business side of the house is this does impact their revenues. This, I mean, all you have to do is go look at what happened to uh, SolarWinds stock, okay, or FireEye stock. Now, FireEye rebounded pretty well. I haven't looked at SolarWinds. But anybody who announces, yeah, I got, you know, caught up in this, people are going to go, well, you know, a lot of people got caught up in it. So it's not entirely your fault. But at the end of the day, it, it's still your fault. So, you know, this has a financial impact to it, to the businesses. So how much more information we're going to get out of them about the details of what happened to whom and to what degree, going to be very difficult. So one additional thing, 
our clients, we've had several that have asked us, you know, hey, please confirm that the, the breach didn't affect you as our vendor. And you know, we're not using solar winds, so we, you know, they just, and they insisted on a, a yes or no answer. So the answer was no in, in our case, or to the best of our knowledge. But it, it highlighted the fact that it, that's really not adequate. If you have vendors, you, you need to revisit their uh, vendor risk assessments and their vendor risk programs. Uh, you know, you can't just take it on good faith or, hey, we have an attestation that they say they're not affected, so we're just going to pass it up the food chain. And I'm concerned how often that's happening and people are, you know, moving forward blindly without realizing they have some exposure or their vendor supply chain has exposure and they, they're taking that as gospel, right? Right, yeah, but uh, even if SolarWinds has obviously problems, you back up into FireEye because basically they went in, as I understand it, uh, through FireEye or at least FireEye found it uh, first. So, and they got into their red uh, team utilities. Uh, what else did they get into? So, uh, so, time, so what yeah. we know time-wise, timeline-wise is that they didn't get into FireEye first. Mm -hmm. The attackers compromised solar winds, and once they got into solar winds, they used that to leverage for months, uh, depending on who you talk to, let's say five to six months, of getting into other individuals. That's how apparently they got into FireEye, and then FireEye detected it. So here's an even more terrifying thing for all of us. All these government agencies, which have effectively an open checkbook and are just supposed to be defending and understanding what goes in and what goes out and everything else. None of them detected it. It was FireEye. And I think that my, my personal belief is that the, you know, leaving FireEye and making so much noise so they were detected was the actor's way of saying, ha ha, we were here, tag, you're it. Because, you know, obviously they got valuable information they probably left little surprises behind, implants behind. Now, in all these environments that they've been in, what can you trust? You can't trust exactly. anything. It's now gone. Yep. Yep. Okay. And if you get known as a vendor that got compromised, how can I trust you? The, the attackers in this one attack scenario, in this one action, caused more harm. And it will have reverberations for more years then probably Snowden's dump of information will. Yeah, and it's all, it's all due to fear. What, yes. what the attackers yeah. have done is that they've created a, a, a sequence of events that have caused the industry as a whole, the technology industry, to begin to fear and, and mistrust, rightly so, the, the controls and the code that make up the fundamental components that, through which large mid-sized to large-sized organizations uh, manage and administer their environments. So uh, you, you're, you're spot on there, Eric. Uh, this, 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 if, if, if nothing else, this was just, you know, the, the, the bad actors waving, you know, the, the house is on fire, there's no way to get out, and they're just outside waving when it came to, came to the FireEye Red Team uh, tool exposure. I think it possibly goes past the management and administration aspect. Um, let's say you could hypothetically mm, somehow declare your data is clean. Okay, phew, dodged a bullet. How are you going to determine that in fact, every single piece of hardware, okay, routers, switches, servers, desktops, every single one of these puppies, is in fact clean, not somehow negatively impacted. So I think when you say that this is gonna have an impact for a while, okay, I'll agree with you there, but I think it's a lot of that is gonna be felt over on the, how do we now come up with a, I don't know, a project plan to methodically go through and slash and burn down every single <laughs> hardware item to rebuild it back up from scratch with known good gold images 
and just start bringing them up in a known good, clean, parallel environment as we slowly, uh, you know, tear one down, clean it up, throw it over on the clean side again. That is just going to take a lot of time. And just like you're going to need the analyst looking at the data and what happened, you're going to need those hands-on technical network security engineer types trying to pull this kind of rabbit out of the hat over the next, I don't know, I'm gonna guess five years at least. Oh, I, I would agree, Daniel. could, could yeah. even be longer. Yeah, Sam, I'm, Samuel, I'm, I'm, gonna give you the, I'm gonna give you the fear moment that I had when I read about this hack. Okay. All right, when I read about, read about this. Everything you just described comes down to one key thing, and that is trust that what you have in front of you is gold. Huh. You can't do that anymore. You right. cannot do that anymore. That's the fundamental fear yep. that's yep. been put on by this attack. So At you, the end of the day. You have to start over with, with your whole infrastructure, your hardware infrastructure, your configurations, your hardening processes, how you but, verify all that. Everything gets scratched, slashed, it, burned, and you start over. But no, it comes back. So go into the chat. I put, a, I put a note in the chat. If I can compromise the developers in some form or fashion, either they're, you know, nation state actors that have been in, that have infiltrated into our, into our supply chain, or they're developers that are part of a legitimate company, and I've compromised them in some other fashion. And they turn around and they, in, they inject code into the normal process that allows me to turn around and take command and control of that piece of whatever I've injected this, that code into. I've completely, irrespective of, of whether or not I ever take command and control of that, so, of that piece of hardware or software, what I've done is I've fomented mistrust in the core fundamentals of technology. And the bad actors act, you know, that's what they've actively done. And, and that's what we're now having to fight against or find ways to deal with other than by saying, you know what, this is all about risk management. And at the end of the day, I'm gonna take some level of risk knowing that the code or the, the hardware, the code on the hardware or the code, the code that's running my software is going to be compromised in some form or fashion. So to, in this, to that point, I, I've just put up the CVE calendar heat map. It's on mm -hmm. GitHub. Yeah. So, and I think there's an under, uh, a hidden message here. So the, the date that these CVEs were discovered is not the date that they were, the vulnerabilities were created. Exactly. Created much earlier. So to, to, to the, the visibility we think we have into our vulnerability landscape, we're, we're looking in the rear view mirror. Yep. And we might not even be looking at the right date. This is what always sucks about IR. As you discover, as you're re going through and looking at an event, your incident event, as you're tearing apart, if you've got a system that was vulnerable, oftentimes what you find is an earlier event that may be completely unrelated to the one that you're currently looking at. Now, all of a sudden, your window for attack is not what you thought it was. You have to go back even further and you keep doing this. And this is not an uncommon thing. Of case in point, one of the things that came out um, early in December, in the middle of all of this, December 8th, is the NSA said, hey, there's a VMware bug you guys need to patch right now. Yep. It was a command injection vulnerability. Well, <laughs> to me, it strikes me as very interesting. You know, was this potentially something else that was used by this attacker? Did it help get them in? Is our date of March for, yep. sol uh, for the SolarWinds stuff, is that far enough back? Or do we need to go back even further? So, I mean, this is, this is a moving line. This, I mean, and I won't be shocked if SolarWinds comes back and goes, wow, we looked at it, we moved the evidence, you know, we went through it again, we got to push this timeline back to February 1. You know, now February 1 to June, anything in there is considered bad. Eric, okay. they've already gone back to fall of 2019. Actually. So, uh, yes, that's it's going to keep going. Yeah, that is true. Uh, the, the other thing is, and... I hate to bring this up, but okay, Apple's come out with their M1 chip and looking out five years, you're looking at potentially a transition from CISC to RISC, uh, going, going an ARM way. So if you're going, if you're an organization and you're looking at a transition 
what this in my mind is do I go ahead and bite off the big enchilada and start looking at a transition from cis to risk? The reason why I bring that up is because that's going to force all your entire supply chain to go back, uh, rebuild, re not totally redesign, but at least uh, go back and replatform. And that's going to essentially better than anything, won't pick up everything, but it will cause uh, an industry-wide cleanup. Now that's going to be the death knell for Intel, um, but it is a possibility because you're going to have to go to it. Uh, it does introduce a new native uh, platform that you're going to be running on, and that's is going to cause uh, the opportunity to catch a lot of these problems. That's a generational attack. I mean, that's exactly. a general, generational defense mechanism, Gordon. I mean, that's, you know, no, I, 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 yeah. I yeah. absolutely agree. But that this incident opens up, cracks that door. I, 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 I always, in situations of this nature, I always come back to the, the one uh, scenario that I, I witnessed in my career, which was, you know, get, trying to get a CFO to um, have, uh, you know, a six character, a six digit pin on his BlackBerry <laughs> and, and watching the CFO throw the BlackBerry against the wall because he didn't want to do six digits. He wanted it to be four digits and hell or high water, it was going to be one, two, three, four to make it easy for him. The challenge that we'll be faced with is irrespective of the technology industry fear that, that each one of us as professionals should be dealing with at the moment. Because as I said, this is, this is the 100% right, 100% of the time moment that, that betrays us as an industry, both from a cybersecurity perspective, as well as a technology perspective. The challenge that we have is that, is that business and operations always wins. You know, I absolutely agree. I'm tossing out something to see if it even sticks to the ceiling. But yeah, yeah. The, the question is, five years from now, when we have the same conversation, how far along in the transition might we be? And, you know, this is like has been pointed out before, this is going to haunt us for the next 10 years. Oh, and I don't well, think I, our next incident will be five years down the road. I think it'll be this no. year. Yeah. And as Eileen says, I, I think, Eric, you brought this, you mentioned this briefly, but she, she in chat, she, she talks about this. You know, the challenge that we face right now is, is now we've got, you know, uh, even a higher degree of sophistication of the attacker who says, hey, I'm just going to plant some bad seeds over there and make you look over there. And then my real attack is over here. So I, I give you this easy piece of malware that you find in your code, you replace it. Hey, now you think everything's okay. You're never gonna be looking for what, what I'm pulling out of your environment um, using my real attack measure. Right. Okay, so sometime down the road, uh, our military planes or commercial planes just start falling out of the sky. Do we all look back at that time and say, gee, I wonder if it had something to do with this? I mean, this, this, the, psycho the psychological effects of this, as Ed and mm -hmm. some of the others were bringing up, is just, oh, it is lingering long term. It's like, when, how will we know when it's over? You won't. You won't. I, can, I, can, I can address that. Uh, Bill Murray said, that information protection is a management problem. And, and as such, it's not something can be solved with technology. What we're talking about is we're talking about a car crash today when we should be talking about safety belts, airbags, and, and training our people to drive more safely. Yeah, it's a gen to Rich's point, it's a generational thing. It's, it's what, um, uh, was it Gordon? Gordon, you brought that up before? Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I, I think that, I did. That, that, that's all generational. I agree with you, Rich. I mean, it's a, it, that's a generational impact uh, set of controls because you know as well as I do that you know there are are still 
you know, nine, uh, 1970s Pintos that are out there and there's probably Pinto, you know, uh, motor clubs, uh, Ford Pinto motor clubs that are out there that gladly drive their Ford, Ford Pintos around and, you know, it, with, with fire, with, you know, fire Firestone paint going the wrong way. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the, the challenge that we have is that we can, we can only assume a certain level of depreciation of risk over a certain mm -hmm. period of time. Car show. Yeah. Go to any classic car show. They're, sh they're shoving V8s into Vegas. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No shoulder harnesses. So it, it's a history of choosing a rapid time to market and competitive features over security over the last three to four decades. Mm -hmm. we, well, I would say especially in the last five years. Yeah. Okay. Anytime somebody says we use agile development, I cringe. Yep. <sighs> yeah well, that's what that's why i brought up what i brought up before when your first conversation eric was like you know this this culminates into this concept of the lack of controls in the devops model when when the developer is the operator and can push code and as long as the co code passes a series of tests that operationally things look right and act right the, therefore the code is considered clean and, and acceptable we have ourselves so, a problem. Right. So, but again, this is where you have to balance the, the you know, the balance beam here, security on yeah. one side, business on the other. And this is exactly what we did is we said, here's a set of controls. Okay. And I caveated it. I said, this should get us to where we have a confidence level. It is not a hundred percent. If something gets mm -hmm. through and it's an escape management, understand it's an escape because you want this automation. You want this automation. I cannot anticipate every scenario. If I could, uh, I'd be a multimillionaire right now. Okay. So this is where you get to take the, and you have to, and it's a management decision. You get to bite the bullet here and say, are we going to do this or not? This is where you earn your money. I can get you make, let you make it fast, but then you risk, you know, this. And if you take that risk, you know, and this is one of the hardest things for me as a security professional over the years to accept is that the business can't accept risk. Even when I look at them and go, are you nuts? They're at the end of the day, the person with that C in front of their name has the right to go, you know what? We've decided we're going to do this. A and I just have to sit back and smile and go, okay, I wouldn't do it if I was you, but more power to you. Yeah. But the problem is that you're having is you or anyone, you don't know whether it's a 5% solution or a 70% solution or a 90% solution. Management doesn't know whether they're effectively taking on a 10% risk, so 2% risk, or... I, I'm going to chime in on this because I had this whole discussion. I've been having this discussion with an individual. This goes back to the whole, I want, you know, people want numeric values to, to risk, quantify versus qualify. And everyone wants to quantify it. And I said, you can't quantify it. And they're like, well, we want numbers. I'm like, based on what? How do you get a number out of security? I don't know how many bad guys are working in the world. I don't know how many bad guys are attempting to, you know, compromise this technology or that technology. I can only estimate. Okay, well, that's good enough. Well, then why isn't my quantifying going high, medium, and low good enough for you? Because we want a number. Fine. Low is a one, two is a medium, and three is a high. There you go. This is the fight that we've been fighting, you know, for my God, I've been fighting this almost 30 years. Tell us a number so we can understand it better. Okay. And we think you're going to get compromised to high risk. How much is it to the business? Which is another interesting angle. How many people have had this problem where you ask the business what types of protection should be around the data? And they go, ah, it's not that critical of data, not that big of a deal. Our losses would be under 100,000. Yet when an event occurs, all of a sudden that data is worth $100 million. Anybody else have that? They forgot to calculate goodwill. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they're also only thinking about the data in that mindset. What they're not thinking about is they don't care about your stinking data in some cases. They want to get on that machine inside of your domain because your domain has a trusted relationship to who they really want to target just down the great information highway. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So, so I'm in a position where I almost can't, I almost feel I can't trust any third-party code. 
uh, that I that I you know any of my software vendors that I've got third party code coming from. I, I well, that's yeah. I don't right trust over. I don't trust code. I don't trust third party code. I don't trust, you know, we got this off of GitHub. I don't care. Okay. And I get called a lot of names, usually involving something with a tinfoil hat because I'm paranoid. Well, you know, you're not paranoid if you're right. Case in point, you know, how many of the, uh, again, here's another stupid analogy, but is very, you know, timely. Microsoft Chrome and Edge extensions. How many of those have we seen lately <laughs> that have had problems? Okay. Yes. How many people allow their users to just download and install Chrome extensions? And the answer is most people, my peers that I've talked to, because I don't, we've got them locked down. It has to go through an approval process and we look at Chrome extensions. And you know the horrible things we find in them? We find mm -hmm. vulnerabilities that haven't been patched in three or four years which as soon as we tell the user, you cannot have this extension, it's got a vulnerability in it. Well, you need to get that fixed. No, I don't. You need to go off to that vendor and say, they need to update their code. Well, that was written by somebody on a Friday night and it's not their job. Guess what? It's not getting patched then, you know? Yeah. But we need it, not my issue, okay? But we find that, we find phone home, we find trust us, your data is safe with us, log in here, we'll keep a copy of it for you. And you find out it's in another country that no, you shouldn't trust at all with anything. And that's just the Chrome extensions. And then we've talked a little bit about the Docker containers. There's another one, analyze them. It doesn't matter what code it is, I'm sorry. I, I, maybe it's just my upbringing, maybe it's because I was in the military, I don't know. I don't trust anybody, I don't trust anybody's data. I don't trust anybody at all, you know? Well, trust us, you're getting a connect network connection from us, you can trust us, we can trust you. No, I like <laughs> firewalls, I like any, I like deny all rules, not any, any rules. And that's what we need to go back to, especially when you have this type of mess. Because you can't trust anybody or anything, you have to default to the lowest common denominator, which is gonna go back to the deny all and then open very selective holes, which in today's business the way the model is working yeah. it's going to impact it greatly and yes. there's where our battle is going to begin because we're going to, have to explain to management and to the business why are we impacting them so much and we're going to have to explain to them that the trust the little trust that we had out there in the world now has been completely eroded by this event well and that was that was the root of the cnc the solar winds did a call home for software updates. And a lot of people got updated without even thinking about it. Yep. And that's where they got, that's where they got compromised. Oh, it was it they automatically that. downloaded the, the next, the next revision. But let's was, think about, I mean, I'll, go ahead, somebody. Oh, uh, I was just going to point out that it goes beyond that because SolarWinds management, the whole company uh, was warned by a uh, external uh, security consultant that, they had problems across the board, and mm -hmm. as a yep. as an ex, uh, as an example, it was uh, Solar Winds one two three as a password, and so they had a good year before any of this. They believe any of this started way back in 2018 uh, that they were uh, organizationally uh, inept, and they did nothing. So. By having an, uh, uh, an inept organization at the sea level down, that's causing the entire ecosystem, everything, everywhere, to uh, start to melt down. Yeah, so two quick comments to that, Gordon. Um, one, uh, couldn't agree with you more in terms of, of the, the, the patching side of this. It's you know, I'll, I'll fully admit to this, to this audience that, you know, when I talk to small business owners, um, you know, I talk about patching and many of them come on up to me. They don't have a, they don't have an IT person, let alone, you know, competency to, to actually review patches and review the, you know, the, the actual contents of the patch, but at least trying to giving them the idea that, Hey, you need to need to make certain you're patching now is, is, is its own, issue and it creates an issue so this concept of automatic patching has what's propagated this this item on out to as many people as it has or many companies it has but the, you know the the other side of that um you know comes on back to 
uh, you know, we're, we're dealing, we're, we're specifically dealing with a couple of different elements. One is that we pr haven't really talked about. We, we touched on it briefly was FireEye and SolarWinds stock. I just did a quick look at the two stocks. FireEye stock as of March 15th of this year, hell, I'll go back a month to RSA. Um, and on February 28th, give it a, you know, mid-February. So uh, FireEye stock was $16 a share. It's now currently 20, 21, $22 a share. SolarWind stock in that same period of time in mid-February was $18 a share and it's currently now 14.55. So I mean, it's not as huge of a hit as everybody, you know, would, would lend itself to believe. And I can tell you, if targets any, any indication, a year from now, none of the, neither of these companies from a stock perspective are going to be impacted. They're going to be up 20, 30, 40% or more. Although You're totally right. Although those two C-level people that sold their stock at uh, SolarWind should be doing some time, I personally think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. The, the other thing that uh, I wanted to, I, I had been thinking about is number one, defense in depth. Uh, all of this started with, with solar winds. Um, but as you architect a system, obviously security, you know, uh, you have, you have to leave the system execution profile pretty well open so that users can actually accomplish uh, good work, but uh, you need some additional de defense in depth. Also, solar winds internally needs to have defense in depth so that when they put a system out to uh, a customer, uh, there's some, I use the word firewalls, but uh, breakaways within their system that, that can detect potentially detect problems, number one. N number two, when everybody's homogeneous, uh, throwing out, laying out, rolling out homogeneous systems, uh, that just uh, provides a propagation highway. But there's also the need for orthogonal problems, of, of orthogonal protections in terms of defense and depth so that you can start to detect uh, easier the, uh, the lateral movements. Well, Gordon, I want to um, prod gently here with the way you said something. I will agree with the gist of what you said, but the way you said it's got me bugged a bit. And I'll just sum it up this way. I cannot tell you how many times I still run in to active directory entries where the vice president of I don't know how to do anything technical is in fact in the domain admins group. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you have any kind of a technical background, you understand exactly what that means. If you're one of those vice presidents, I'm sorry, it's not a slam against you. It's actually, you should pick that up as a slam against your security people, perhaps, or your management not giving your security people enough time while your management holds off your executives. You have to let these folks do things to solve the real issues rather than doing the quick drop them in the grease so we can all get out of here on Friday and you get ripped off over the weekend wondering what the heck happened. I absolutely, totally, 1000% agree with you. Actually, uh, Eric, if you think back 15 years, we had this conversation where you were telling me, no, you can't do any, you can't do that. I was a software developer. <laughs> yes, I do recall some of those discussions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, We've I, all had them. But, you know, it, it, it's a, this is a, an extraordinarily tough problem. We're still peeling the onion. Uh, I had a conversation with 
uh, email today with someone and I pointed out, you know, for years, I'm not getting political. I'm just using this as, a, as an example that uh, everyone said Clinton's email server had not been breached. You know, two years later, it turns out everybody was uh, breaching the email. They even, the, the hackers had to do patch management to the point where everybody in the world had access and was reading the, the email in real time, except for the American voters. Uh, <laughs> the same thing is, is going to be here. And the key is that the, the highway through solar winds, I don't know whether it's one, five, ten, it's some number, one is too many, uh, other developers that will have picked up a hack and has gone to ground. And in a year or two, it'll become active as Eric uh, has pointed out. And all of a sudden it'll remanifest itself in a slightly different way, only to be rolled out in their product. Yeah, I have, there's an interesting hypothesis that I have going on around SolarWinds right now, and it's based on, on a time, an examination of the company by time. And what it comes down to is the cultural, the cultural aspects of SolarWinds as a company. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of the fact that back in the early 2000s, um, there was this small little company called SolarWinds that came on out and put out this wonderful engineer's toolbox. Engin yes, yep. I had one. And, yep. And the engineer's toolbox was a phenomenal toolbox of terrific network and systems administration tools that also seconded as a terrific pen testing toolkit. Because yes. I could turn around and I could use that same exact engineer's toolkit to walk MIBs, to you know, download configs, to to compromise systems, to you know, to do whole whole on attacks that I would normally have to write those exploits back in the day. That same cultural element propagated now, call it almost twenty plus years later, has now you know sh sh sown itself is my hypothesis. It's sown itself into the cultural elements of SolarWinds that at the end of the day, they, they mask themselves as, a, um, as an administrative toolkit. But the reality is, is that the hacker culture, the, I shouldn't say not in a bad way. I should say hacker in a bad way. Uh, the attacker mentality is, is also still there embedded inside their culture. I don't know that for certain. I just, it's just a hypothesis that I have, but it'd be, I think it'd be a really interesting aspect to really dig into the, 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 the development and cultural mindset at SolarWinds to actually deter, make a determination. Could this have just been an inside job that allowed this propagation to occur and allowed this to, to, to be compromised in the fashion that they've been compromised? So, Ed, I'll, I'll take that an extra step further. I believe what happened with that is I, you know, I've used SolarWinds Toolkit for many years and actually had one that we had to evaluate here not too long ago. Mm -hmm. And it, it had uh, the early days was more of the they, they accepted uh, they accepted patches from people and they accepted, you know, uh, improvements from people. But I think what happened with SolarWinds is they got enticed by this, quote unquote, single pane of glass solution. Yes, and they started taking plugins. They started taking code from every little corner of GitHub or whatever, wherever they got it, or wherever their software vendors were. And they just they didn't do uh, good software maturity. They yep. just plugged stuff in and said, "Hey, we have a solution that's a single pane of glass." And I think that's where they got bit. Yeah, that's that's fair. That's fair. But again, but again, it comes back to, uh, you know. As Eric's talked about, you know the mat the maturing DevSecOps aspect of security by design, embedded controls, and you know think about what Rich Rich Owen talked about when he was and, and Gordon was talking about. You know these are generational aspects and generational controls that we used to have. You know there was a time when you know at least from a defect management and you know standard 
waterfall to operate, you know, waterfall methodologies and, and, and operations being separated from, de from development. There was a time when we used to have those things in place. There's a part of me that, it, again, the hypothesis that I would put forward is, do we go back to that? Do we try to emphasize going back to that and going back to that kind of methodology and that kind of an approach? You know, it, it will, it, it will, have its ramifications and impacts will again be considered the group that says no all the time uh, but maybe that's what maybe that's warranted in this particular case so i'm gonna i'm gonna believe it or not i'm gonna side for a minute with devops i know i'm agreeing with the enemy but the nice <laughs> no. thing about <laughs> devops there is an upside to devops and i'm trying to be fair because so often i bash everyone and you know, oh, woes, the world is coming to an end. There is an upside to DevOps. The upside is, is that if it is a true automated process from the time it gets submitted by the developer till the time it is into production, okay, mm -hmm. let's say we're talking about, let's say we're talking about containers for our DevOps scenario. If that process is automated, that checks and balances, and if it doesn't pass, it drops out, that is a repeatable process that should be Everything falls through. I don't have, well, Joe talked to Tom and bypassed yeah. it because, so if I can force everyone into that same funnel, going down that same tunnel to come out the other side, I've got a huge win. Now, my problem is making sure that my checks and balances that are automated, that are scripted in there are what I want. And I can tell you, we've, we're now in our third iteration to where we continue to mature it. And it is pushing some of the developers of the software that we use for the checks because they're like, wow, no one's ever told us that they would want to do this reoccurring check. We thought it was a one-time thing, right. you know, and I would point out, no, vulnerabilities. We get new ones every day. How do I recheck my containers on a regular basis, an automated basis? And if it fails, I get an alert. They get an alert. They get a chance to fix it per our patching process. But if they don't patch it in the timeline that they're given, it's killed. The, the process is no longer allowed to spin up. And you can automate all this. And we have been. So this is a very positive thing. Is it where I want it to be as draconian security as I want it to be along that tunnel? No, but it's getting better with every iteration and it's adding stability. So this is where the DevOps is a good thing, but you have to be able to mature it. And what this event is gonna do in our environment is allow us to continue to mature it because people are gonna go, ah, they're right. We do need to continue to improve it. So again, there is an upside to the DevOps as long as it is, again, I always look at it like it as a balanced beam, you know, yeah, security on fair. one side, business on the other. But yep. if either one of them gets too heavy, then bad things are going to happen. You have to keep it balanced. Yeah, no, you're, you're spot on there, Eric. You're spot on. Eric, let me ask you a, <clears throat> pardon me, a quick question. Have you cut your DevOps team onto a private network? So the DevOps team themselves, so the process, all the tools that I'm referring to are on their own net, yes. So things go into the pipeline, they get tested while they're under test, that way they don't impact production, if that makes sense. And then they come out on the other side, then they can go into production or they go into, they can go into production, they can go into staging, they can go into dev back into dev environment. So I think something similar for you, Gordon, uh, in a scenario that I had set up, uh, I would say we had development, we had test and we had production. And I think we use the term test, uh, like, uh, Eric's using staging. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so development was done, it was thrown out in a uh, test environment that was set up to mimic on a scaled down version of what production would be like. And uh, when it got through that, and it might have ping ponged back and forth a few times, and, but when it finally got through that, then it was carefully uh, planned for bringing out to production. And the great thing about the DevOps process is that if the developer submits something new and it goes, starts going down the tunnel and it's bad and we kill it, we get a notice and they get a notice of what the problem is. And they're told, go fix it. 
So if they've used vulnerable software packages or things like that, it doesn't go into production. It doesn't go into test. It doesn't go into dev. You must go fix this developer. And if they say, I don't want to, it doesn't go any further. It's very simple. Okay. Right, but go back and look at solar winds. The, obviously, since an intruder got into their development, they weren't cut off. Go back to Microsoft, where Microsoft is admitted it's gotten into uh, number one intruders have been able to look. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna provide a little bit of air cover for solar winds. Okay. So what it means is the bad guy got into solar winds and was able to we don't know what they did to be perfectly honest let's run under the hypothetical of okay they injected a code or uh, they injected a module some sort of api that they knew how to call and wake up but no one else did okay this goes back to our earlier conversation about unused code well if the unused code went through the pipeline and it had no vulnerabilities it would trigger no flags Okay. Now you could have a flag set up saying, hey, this code's never called. But again, not knowing how they process their software, that they may not have had that flag. They may not care about that. I don't know. There's too many things for us to, to surmise at this point to understand what's going on. But there is an entire, it is entirely possible for a bad guy to inject clean code at a point or API and it won't trigger anything. I can see that happening very easily. I agree with you. The point that I was making was that they shouldn't be able to get into uh, the DevOps group, number one, or number two, I'll give Microsoft some air cover here where they said that they indicated that intruders have been able to view the code, but not be able to change anything. Uh, so that's one half. The other half is, I think they indicated four or 40 organizations were somehow affected by yeah, 40 for uh, by some items. So that indicates that somehow something broke through the Chinese firewall into well, their DevOps group to be able to put something into the code base. Let's again, let's play hypothetical again. If I wanted to get in, if my job as an attacker, somebody said, I've got a payload, I need you to get into there, I need to be able to inject it into their code, what am I going to do? I'm going to target a developer. I'm going to target a developer with a phishing attack or something like that. I'm not going to target you know, an administrative person, I'm a targeted developer. And if they got in, and again, this is all hypothetical, I have no knowledge of how they did get in, but if a phishing attack worked, okay, on a developer, and that's how they got their toehold, they, that developer would perfectly have rights into the DevOps process. So that's not much of a leap. So again, until we understand, if we ever understand the full scenario of what happened at SolarWinds, we may not know, you know, what happened here. And again, there's very nasty ways to, to get people to click on things. I mean, it's no longer, I wish phishing emails had misspellings and, you know, the grammar was poor like it was 20 years ago. They look really good now and some of them are really hard and, you know, they don't, they don't, uh, you know, they won't trip sandboxes and things like that because they're smart enough to know. Don't trip on the first two clicks or what have you. So it's entirely possible that they could have gotten nailed. You know, one developer got nailed by a phishing attack and that opened the door to the, this whole cascade event. Now, the big question is, do they have the logs to be able to tell what happened and when it happened? And that goes back to storage. <laughs> yes. Storage and, and your selectivity on what you're logging, because you can't log everything. Oh, yeah. No, you can't. I, I mean, and of course, we all have lawyers in our organizations. And the first thing a lawyer will tell you is, is you know, it, you know, this is the legal requirement for retaining it, burn it after that. And on a related note, I was reading that the code, the Orion code, when it uh, infected the target, it laid dormant for about 14 days. And yep. 
I'm guessing part of that is to avoid sandboxing technology. Yeah. Yeah. So we're just seeing an a, a escalation of, of technologies because sandboxing we're, is is kind of right now it's the hot and the hot thing to basically protect. <clears throat> the so I was just reading about that today and it was to lay dormant for up to 14 days. I never was able to find what was the minimum day. And I wasn't thinking in terms of the anti-sandboxing activity, I was thinking um, uh, more about um, IDS type of uh, um, equipment, finding a connection something happened and then immediately the machine turned right around and start phoning home because I know that some of the IDS, um, what are they? I don't, not filters, but uh, rules. There you go. Rule set. They want to, they want to look for stuff like that. So we've got a minute left. That's enough time, Eric, for you to give us the good news. <laughs> um, it's a new year and we all have plenty of job opportunities. Yes. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yep. As I, as I like to say to all you know, people I talk to and that aren't in our industry, I've been doing this for over 30 years and, I, and I've never been unemployed. <laughs> so there you go. And, and to that end, that. I would like to offer up one other statement about that, especially to anyone who considers themselves a, a senior. Um, I would just encourage you all to at least take an individual under your wing and mentor them. We need more strong security people and the only way we're going to get them is to help mentor the, the juniors and get them up to speed and um, you know I, I've got a couple now and I flat out I'll tell them I will throw them sometimes to the wolves because that's the way the system is and be right there so when they start crying I can help them. But I would encourage everyone, you know, please, please, please be mentoring. And if you want, be like me and come join higher ed. We need you too. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, stay where everybody is at and just hire, hire all the graduates out of Boise State. There you go. <laughs> That'll work too. Yeah or, yeah, yeah. or join a nonprofit like I did. There you go. There, there you go. go. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. All right. Until next time. Thanks. Yeah, thank yep. you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Great group dynamic. Enjoyed it. Pick it up next month. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, John. Thanks, John.